diabetes, of course. Um, so let me introduce uh, Dr. Norma Kenyon, who wears a number of hats here at the university, but one of them is as Senior Associate Dean for Translational Research. Thank you. Welcome, and uh, thank you for being here today. I'm going to give just a brief overview of some statistics that many of you probably already know, but also done just a brief synopsis of state of the art. I did see some of your questions, so I have a slide I think you'll like, and uh, then tell you about some of our research here at UM. But um, these are the numbers taken from the American Diabetes Association website for the statistics for diabetes in the United States. So it's about 8.3% of the population has diabetes. That's almost 26 million people. If you look at the global numbers, that's about 9% of what we see globally. So you can imagine if there are 7 million undiagnosed people in the United States, there's about 70 million around the world. 80 million people in the U.S. with prediabetes, we're talking almost 800 million with uh, prediabetes worldwide. Diabetes is growing by a million per year. We, know, we all know it's a major cause of mortality and morbidity. And the cost in 2007 is $174 billion in the United States alone, 12% of that for medications and supplies, 50% for um, hospital inpatient care. So I actually think I've heard a more recent number that almost one out of every four healthcare dollars is spent on the care and treatment of type 1 diabetes. And also I should say that Dr. Schuyler Gretzky cannot be here today. We were actually communicating last night. He's in China. Um, I was having him look at the slides and we were going back and forth and he was kind enough to provide me with this one, which shows the global epidemic of diabetes and the fact that by the year 2030, it's predicted that about 439 million people worldwide will have diabetes. What that amounts to is a global health catastrophe. I thought the tornado was perfect considering recent events. And um, <clears throat> so then I'll just move into, for type 2 diabetes, um, over, historically the drugs that have been used are not particularly effective and don't help people control their glycemic level. So there are many new approaches to treating diabetes that have come along. Glucagon, like, like peptide 1, increases insulin secretion and also insulin synthesis, decreases glucagon um, secretion. Um, and also uh, slows gastric emptying. So this drug can help normalize glycemia. It has other effects as well. I'm sorry, GLP-1 itself. And it can also um, allow for weight loss. And the GLP-1 analogs that have been developed to address the fact that GLP-1 itself has a very short half-life um, are very effective in normalizing postprandial glucose and allowing for some weight loss, but they are injectables. The DPP-4 inhibitors, on the other hand, inhibit the enzyme that's responsible for degrading GLP-1, like peptides. And, but they are not associated with weight loss. They're weight neutral. On the other hand, it's an oral medication. And more recently, the SGLT-2 inhibitors um, have come along. The SGLT SGLT2 molecule or the sodium glucose co-transporter in the kidney is responsible for 90% of the glucose reabsorption in the body. So by inhibiting the action of those molecules, you can actually excrete a lot more urine through the kidney. And uh, these, many of these uh, trials are ongoing, and I want to thank Dr. Marks for providing me with all of this data. Um, also for type 2 diabetes, uh, just briefly, clinically here at the University of Miami, there's a great deal of effort, and our two experts are here. Um, uh, Dr. Ron Goldberg heads up the Diabetes Prevention Program, which is an NIH-funded study to look at lifestyle interventions in type 2 diabetes, and Dr. Jennifer Marks next to him has been heading up the Veterans Administration Diabetes Trial, um, also to look at the effect of glycemic control and long-term outcomes. <coughs> I think one thing, about 10% of people with diabetes have type 1, which is an autoimmune syndrome that results in insulin deficiency. And I don't think that what most people don't realize is that type 1 diabetes is dramatically on the rise, increasing by 3 to 5% per year, thought to be due to environmental causes. There's a lot of people looking at um, microbes in the gut now. And one of the other more disturbing things is that the incidence of type 1 diabetes in very young children is also increasing dramatically. So um, just put this slide up here. I think one of the things many people think of type 1 as a small market, but actually type 1 diabetes is, is quite a platform for testing novel immune intervention agents to look at patients at risk or at onset, and also in the transplantation setting to test novel drugs because if a transplant of insulin-producing cells is rejected, it's, it's gone. You don't have to have surgery to remove a pancreas, et cetera. So it really offers many opportunities. In addition, uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, all of those patients have to monitor their glucose and try to uh, uh, 
uh, control their glucose levels. So um, novel technologies for sensing glucose become very important. And also many of the type 2 drugs that were on the previous slide, we have started using them in some of our islet transplant studies. Um, and they actually dramatically improve the function of the transplant. So there's a lot of crossover there. Um, this is a child that was diagnosed at 14 months of age. Those are just the numbers calculated for her at nine, nine years of age. And you can see the number of finger sticks. This is my daughter at nine. I decided to stop counting. She's 19 now. So the therapy, current state of the art, which is really not very artful in my opinion, insulin injections. We are very fortunate now that we have long-acting and short-acting insulins that are far superior to what we had almost 20 years ago. Uh, these patients, similar to type 2, but especially with type 1, frequent glucose monitoring. There are pens and syringes for injecting the different insulins, insulin pump therapy, and we now have continuous monitors that can give you 288 tissue glucose readings over a 24-hour period. However, um, most people aren't really fond of wearing those. And while it's been proven in the diabetes complications and control trial that intensive therapy can prevent uh, complications in many individuals, only about 10 percent of the population can really maintain this. And I've been told that the numbers are really fairly similar for type 2. Um, but there's also frequent hypo and hyperglycemia. So moving forward to some of the strategies that we're following here at UM, Dr. Sylvia Donnert here um, has a novel technology, and I'm sure she'll be glad to answer questions if I get this wrong. I feel similar to Mark Lipman talking about these brilliant scientist strategies. If I say anything wrong, forgive me. But uh, Sylvia's developed with some of her collaborators in Kentucky and California a glu glucose sensing catheter that takes advantage of a glucose, um, bind, or glucose recognition peptide. And what she's done is by using site-directed mutagenesis, they introduce a fluorescent probe in an area of the protein that doesn't affect glucose binding. And these probes are also sensitive to conformational changes. So when the glucose binds to the catheter, the conformation changes, now the probes fluoresce. There's a lot of advantages to that because um, you don't have to worry about uh, reagents, glucose consumption, or chemical conversion, so you don't have problems with degradation. Uh, it's stable for long periods of time. And uh, right now, just to give you an idea here, the concept that they have first come up with, knowing that there are already glucose continuous monitors being developed for the tissue, they've developed a catheter that can be used in hospital inpatients for continuous glucose sensing, sensing intravenously. And I'm sure she'd be glad to tell you more about that, but obviously this has implications for both type 1 and 2 diabetes. Um, in addition, Dr. Tony Bianco, who's sitting next to Sylvia, is working on another pathway, which may not be immediately obvious, looking at deiodinases that um, govern thyroid, thyroid hormone signaling in cells. When you look at thyroid hormone levels in the plasma, they are not necessarily indicative of what's happening with thyroid hormone signaling in the cells. And um, Tony specifically has looked at the action of a type 2 deiodinase, which will, for simplicity in my tongue tripping, we'll call D2, converts T4, the thyroid hormone T4, into T3. And T3 actually, especially in brown adipose tissue and skeletal muscle, can increase energy expenditure, increase the oxidation of fatty acids. Bottom line, it has a lot of effects that can lead to um, weight loss, uh, less, less adipose tissue. So we actually did a knockout mouse, the D2 knockout, and you can see in the bottom right corner there that the knockout mouse is, is um, uh, gains weight and, am I getting this reversed, Tony? Am I saying this right? <laughs> that the, uh, when you do the knockout, it has an effect on the levels of adiposity and, and weight gain. So this is another pathway that if you could target the D2 pathway, you could increase energy expenditure by the cells and um, patients would lose weight and have better glucose tolerance. So moving to type 1 and some of our research in that area, uh, type 1 diabetes has a broad spectrum of time points in which you could intervene, including um, uh, Jay Schuyler is the head of the NIH type 1 diabetes trial net. We can now predict people who are at risk for the onset of type 1 diabetes, so there's opportunities to intervene early, for example, with autoantigen type vaccines that would induce a regulatory response, as an example. You can intervene at the time of onset uh, because there is a, we don't know the exact time course, it varies among individuals, but, but diabetes progresses. And at onset, you still have a significant islet mass, and if you could stop that immune response, you could preserve the beta cell mass, it would most likely recover, and you could uh, do well. So uh, there are many trials going on in that area. Once a patient has lost their islet mass completely and is frankly uh, gluc insulin deficient, they need biological replacement therapy in order to have uh, better control of their diabetes. So we would like to stop immune destruction 
with biologicals, vaccines, other interventions, preserve beta cell mass in those at new onset, and in those patients who have already lost most of their cells, look at beta cell replacement or regeneration. I already mentioned that there's a, um, the, the, the uh, home for the type 1 diabetes trial net consortium is here at the University of Miami, chaired by Dr. Schuyler. Dr. Marks and I are both um, working within that consortium, and I've already mentioned the different areas where we're trying to intervene, and um, already many trials are in progress in the interest of time. I, I won't go through them, but we're looking at biologicals that target T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, co-stimulatory molecules, and also autoantigen-specific vaccines that can induce a regulatory response. For those patients who have progressed to full type 1 diabetes, we have a large effort here at the University of Miami and the Diabetes Research Institute, chaired by Dr. Camillo Ricordi, where in this case we're isolating islets out of a donor pancreas and transplanting them um, into the liver. These are the types of results you can get. These are islet transplant patients on the top. Their 24-hour blood glucose profile before transplant when they are fully diabetic and the type of profile you see post-islet transplantation. So I, transplantation of insulin-producing cells can and does get people off of insulin. It's, it's effective. The challenge has been having the right types of intervention agents that allow us to maintain the islets long term. The good news is even as they become insulin dependent again, taking small doses of insulin, most of them still have some function and are able to maintain better glycemic control in the absence of hypoglycemia. So Dr. Ricordi is the chair of the Clinical Islet Transplant Consortium, 12 collaborating institutions worldwide working to improve the outcome of islet isolation and transplantation. Um, the other things that we're working on that are very important, alternative sites of implant. Right now we put them in into the liver. But the truth is that ultimately we will need another source of insulin producing cells on the next line there because there are only 2,000 organ donors per year. I d I've done a lot of work over the years um, in larger animal models of diabetes, and the question becomes, if we can figure out how to scale these cells up, make enough of them to actually reverse diabetes, where are we going to put them? How are we going to house them in the body? So we've been working very aggressively looking at alternative sites of implantation and, and how to attach, put cells within scaffolds and devices and capsules, as someone asked me about, to try to protect them from the immune system. And um, so we're also looking at novel immune intervention agents. Um, we want to be able to, um, the other important point that I wanted to make is that we have cured type 1 diabetes in mice over 250 times, has not translated to humans. Uh, you know, everyone talks about heterologous immunity and the fact that our immune systems are far, far more complex. Um, the truth is that mouse islets are also very different <coughs> structurally, not only structurally but functionally, and you can see that the insulin-producing insulin cells in the mouse are located centrally, whereas in pigs, dogs, non-human primates, and humans, they're distributed throughout the islet. So at the institute, we have the whole spectrum of models with a goal of translating to people. Only two more slides, I promise. This is an area that we're all working. It's a tremendous team effort with biomedical engineer, immunologists, cell biologists, looking at can we devise scaffolds or devices that either elute drugs locally or deliver drugs locally so that even if we use currently available immunosuppressants that have a lot of systemic toxicity, they'd be effective locally at preventing rejection of recurrent autoimmunity. And again, because this can apply to other cell types, or whatever cell types in different parts of the body. And so we have a tremendous effort there. And this is the last slide I just wanted to show you that we actually have the first data in the world showing that using uh, islets along with mesenchymal stem cells, which produce immunomodulatory factors locally. Uh, we can transplant um, islets into an alternative site, in, in this case an amino pouch in a large animal model. Uh, the animal comes off insulin. There is a delay in the alternative sites, and you can see at the end there, the green bars are the insulin requirement, and black is fasting uh, glucose. When you remove the explant, uh, the blood sugar shoots up. You go back to full insulin dependence. And um, we now have an animal over 430 days off insulin uh, with scaffolds and in a mental pouch site. So these can provide a platform not only for type 1 diabetes but other therapies as well.